Well, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving day this past Thursday. It was my 22nd Thanksgiving, and I know that's hard for some of you to believe because I look so much older. (laughs) Might take some a while to connect those dots because we're processing a little slower, right? We've been going a little slower the last couple of days, and then there's the tryptophan. Is that a thing, true or false, tryptophan? I think it's true. Tryptophan, turkey. I asked a friend this past week how he prepared the turkey. He said he pretty much just leveled with him and told him he wasn't going to make it. (laughs) Yeah, that's the best I can do. It's the tryptophan. That's the best humor I've got. If I just stop and say tryptophan during this message, you know I'm just letting my mind catch up. I would say that Thanksgiving is becoming fast one of my favorite holidays. I mean, I love Christmas and Easter for the spiritual and eternal significance, but those times of year being in ministry for our family have always been pretty full, whereas Thanksgiving is just all about Thanksgiving. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because when we moved here uh, 22 plus years ago, and some of you are finally going, oh, I get it. I get why he's only had 22 Thanksgivings. He's not from here. But then you're thinking, do they celebrate Thanksgiving in Australia? Well, that's up there with asking us if we celebrate 4th of July. And I have been asked that more than once over the last two decades. But when we moved here 22 plus years ago and came to grips with the fact that here in America... You have a holiday that's all about eating, sleeping, football, and family. We were like, God bless America. (laughs) We were thankful. So what am I grateful for this Thanksgiving? I'm grateful for family, for friends, for the freedom we enjoy in this country and those that stand in harm's way committed to defending it for us. Thankful for them. Most of all, I'm thankful for spiritual freedom, that when we choose to follow Jesus, our citizen is in heaven, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there. When we choose to follow Jesus, the best is always yet to come. So I'm grateful for that. That's a reason to always be grateful. So I didn't grow up with Thanksgiving, but I did grow up in the church. And we grew up singing an old hymn. Hymn is a churchy word for song. And uh, that, that old hymn back in Australia, I didn't realize that over here it's actually a Thanksgiving hymn. Some of you may remember this, who grow, grew up in the church and sang this traditional hymn around Thanksgiving time. Beautiful melody, beautiful lyrics that I thought I should recite today. For the beauty of the earth. For the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. A reminder that we always have a reason to be thankful for God's presence, his love over and around us lies. It's all around. The the song goes on. To recite, for the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild. Now you may or may not resonate with those lyrics. Maybe Thanksgiving is a really hard time for you. Maybe it's a lonely time and you're desperate for the joy of human love. Or maybe this holiday season, there's an empty place at your table and the grief is so thick, you're not sure that you'll even make it through another day. Or maybe for you, family is just messy. And Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner is less like the Norman Rockwell print and more like Christmas vacation with the Griswolds and cousin Eddie. But remember, we always have a reason to be grateful John Ortberg wrote, Gratitude is the ability to experience life as a gift. It liberates us from the prison of self-preoccupation. So Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. The song goes on. For the church that evermore, lifting holy hands above, offering up on every shore her pure sacrifice of love. I'm grateful for the church. The Bible describes the church as the bride of Christ or the the body of Christ. I'm grateful for this church community that's seen us through 22 Thanksgivings, that's been our family. For the reminder that church isn't just an organization you're a part of, 
It's a family you belong to. And so today we're going to talk about the church in a two-part talk this morning. We're going to talk about the church. We're going to talk about the joy of human love, specifically marriage, as we close out this message series titled For Better, For Worse. And we'll start with marriage, part one, marriage, because I'm thankful for my bride, Mandy. We celebrated 22 Thanksgivings, but this January we'll celebrate 24 years married. And we've talked in this series about how all marriages have their ups and their downs. And if you missed a week of this series, I encourage you to go listen online, watch online, because there are insights for everybody. Those married, those who have been married, those who want to be married, those who are happy being single and having deep, meaningful relationships. There's something in it for everybody. And this morning, I'm going to offer some of my perspective, but also more truth from God's word, Paul's words to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 5. We've been camping out there during this series. And today, just one verse from Ephesians 5, verse 32, as we close out this series, Paul makes a great statement about marriage right here when he says, this is a great mystery. True or false? I'd say it's true, Paul. He says, this is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. That's why we're talking about the church and marriage this morning, two parts. So we're starting with marriage. I'm going to give you some of our experience after 24 years. Actually, I'm going to share with you a recent experience we had this year. Early in the summer, in July, we took a vacation in Mexico. Mandy and I, our two boys, and my parents who were visiting from Australia. We were so excited about this vacation, and we needed it. We'd been going hard as a family. I'd been working hard. We'd been doing lots of travel, sports travel, work travel, and we got to take this vacation. I was putting a lot of expectation on this vacation being just right. Actually, I was putting a lot of expectation on Mandy to help make this vacation be just right and perfect. So the first morning, we're at breakfast at the resort in Mexico, and Mandy receives an email about a project we'd been working on, letting us know that we would have to give it significant attention that week to keep moving it forward. And I was ticked. Tryptophan. I was like going off at her at breakfast about how there were things that she could have done to have moved that forward quicker so that this hadn't happened on our vacation, not true. And I was threatening to be uncooperative that week and all the work that we had done would have been out the window, correction, all the work Mandy had done would be out the window and she didn't respond too well to my little attitude. In fact, she got up and walked out on me at breakfast that first morning of vacation. Fortunately, mum and the boys were already at the pool. It was just left me and dad sitting there with his eyebrows raised and him asking the question, well, how's this going to go? <laughs> well, we've been doing family, marriage, vacation, kids and grandparents long enough for it to go just fine. We enjoyed the kids, we enjoyed the grandparents, we enjoyed the beautiful surroundings, but Mandy and I weren't doing well. We weren't communicating well. We were often kind of hostile towards each other. We were disconnected and we were just off. Well, fast forward to the end of summer. End of August, I celebrated a milestone birthday. And as is our habit when we celebrate milestone birthdays and we seem to be racking them up now and they're coming around pretty quickly, we decided to get away just the two of us. And we, so we did that. And it was an amazing few days away. Deep conversations, honesty, extending grace to one another, fun activities together, times of intimacy. Those moments Matt has talked about in this series where you remember that you don't just choose to love your spouse, but you really like each other, best friends. Those reminder moments, I say, in a marriage where you look at your spouse after a, a number of years and you experience them a certain way or see them do a certain thing and you go, ah, I remember why I chose you as my person and still would. I remember. Great times of connection, connectedness. Friends, this is a great mystery. Marriage is full of peaks and valleys. And I want to offer 
today some humble advice as we close out this message series for better, for worse, and say in marriage as in life, don't quit in the valley. Don't quit in the valley. Because that's where the growth and the learnings and the humility and the surrender is cultivated and truly learned. Don't quit in the valley. And by geographical necessity, valleys are only made possible because of surrounding hills and mountains. So if you continue to forge the way forward, you'll eventually come out of it. And I know there are deep and long valleys. But if you didn't have the valleys, you wouldn't have the mountaintop experiences, right? And marriage, relationships, life would be as boring as a straight road that goes on for days through the outback of Australia, flat. They even put bends in those roads that aren't even needed to keep the overland truck drivers from falling asleep at the wheel. And you don't want to fall asleep at the wheel of your marriage. Now, I do want to acknowledge that the memory I share is a simplified memory at a resort in Mexico. We have had deeper, darker valleys in our relationship that are still too painful to talk about. And there are people in this room and watching and listening online that haven't survived the valley. Their marriages, your marriages, haven't survived the valley for tragic reasons. The loss of a child, a terminal diagnosis, mental illness, abuse, There's grace to cover that and there's a firm foundation on which to rebuild. We'll get to that. I also want to acknowledge that it takes two people to choose not to quit in the valley. Those are the vows we make on our wedding day, that covenant, that agreement that says for better, for worse, on the mountaintop in the the valley during the highs and the lows. You know, in ministry as pastors, we find ourselves in counseling situations with couples where we get to remind them that quitting is never the easy option, regardless of the circumstances. Now, in abusive situations and relationships, it's often the safe and appropriate option, but it's never the easy one. So where possible, don't quit in the valley. But there are absolutely some things you should quit, and I want to share a few of them with you this morning. Firstly, quit delaying dealing with your stuff because the person you are most responsible for in your relationship is who you so deal with your stuff deal with your baggage we all carry it around the more work you can do on self-awareness and showing up as your best self is only going to contribute to a healthy marriage in fact in in Ephesians 5 the very next verse Paul instructs husbands to love their wives as they love themselves which kind of sounds selfish, right? But when you think about it, spouses, husbands or wives, we can't love the other unless we truly love ourselves. And that's why it's a biblical commandment that we often brush over because it's just the second half of one. Love your neighbor as you what? As you love yourself, Mark 12, 31. So let me share another personal example of this. I've never been great at self-care. Being in the people business, I've always prioritized people over taking care of myself. And after a number of years, experiences, and some therapy, I realized that that's not heroic, that's actually careless. And the person that that affects the most is the person most important to me, and that's Mandy, and not in the ways that you would think. You see, when I get, when when I I perceive that she's not giving me the attention that I think I deserve, which is kind of ironic, right? Because I'm not giving me the attention that I deserve. When I perceive that she's not giving me the attention I deserve, I get irritated. But I've learned that that's projection. Because deep down, I'm actually irritated at me for not giving attention to me. When you focus on making you a better you, you become a better we tryptophan catch up with that one here's a shout out for counseling and therapy do it do it before you feel like you need to because when you show up there you'll realize you need to it's one of the greatest gifts that you can give your spouse and all your key relationships one of the greatest gifts you can give to yourself. You learn to ask great questions and great questions determine the quality of your marriage. Questions like, how can I be a better husband? How can I be a better wife? How can I be a better friend? How can I be a better parent? Let me talk to the fellas for just a minute because I am one, so I've earned the right to talk to the fellas. Guys, we need 
to be less focused on ourselves. Now, self-preoccupation is different than self-care. That's a whole other talk. But the definition of humility is thinking of yourself less, right? And Matt talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We need to think less about the physical and more about the emotional and the spiritual. I mean, on a given day, we might be thinking, oh, our wife doesn't look, my wife doesn't look all that great today. Let me ask you a question. Have you looked in the mirror lately? You're a joke compared to her. This is just my opinion, but the male species compared to the female species, we're pretty much a joke. Come on. Okay, just my opinion. I'm going to move on now. Quit delaying dealing with your stuff. Quit being fake. Now I'm keeping it real, right? Anything less than honesty, complete honesty, transparency, and sincerity with those closest to us is exhausting. We use these fillers like, oh, to be honest, or to be completely candid, or to be totally transparent. Honestly, seriously, we need to be honest, candid, and transparent all the time with those people that we're closest to. Because to be fully known is to be fully loved. We heard about that in the second week of the series. Go back and take a look at that. Paul talks about that being the absolute pinnacle of all kinds of love in what's known as the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 when he says, Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. You see, the longer we're together, trust me, the sweeter the journey becomes as we step deeper into the journey of discovery. Ruby D said it takes a long time to be really to really be married. It takes a long time to really be married. One marries many times at many levels within a marriage. As we continue to say yes to loving each other in a deeper and deeper way. Any good relationship is built on trust and being real and honest are important parts of the soil of trust. So is vulnerability. Author Brene Brown describes vulnerability as the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, courage, empathy, and creativity. And it's the source of hope, empathy, accountability, and authenticity. Alternatively, the definition of vulnerability is this. The quality or state of being exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed either emotionally or physically. Well, that doesn't sound like fun. But therein lies the great mystery. One of the very things needed for a healthy relationship actually opens you up to the worst possible emotional harm. That's where trust comes in. And in a marriage, as a spouse, we know our spouse so well that we know how to hurt them emotionally in the worst possible ways with our words, yet we choose not to. Now, I know that's difficult for some to hear that have been in an abusive, emotionally abusive relationship. I'm sorry if that's your story. Maybe you're in one right now and I encourage you today to please get help. Don't be silent about that. Don't deal with that in isolation. There are resources and there is help right here. Come see us, come talk to us. But words are powerful, invest them. Well, we talked about the power of words in our series on Proverbs a couple of months ago, how words can build up or tear down. Invest them well in your spouse. Build up, don't tear down. Bless, don't curse with your words. Heal, don't wound with your words. Keep it real quit being fake, and quit building sandcastles. Quit building sandcastles. What do I mean by that? That takes us to another text for us today out of Matthew chapter 7. These are Jesus' words. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents, The floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house. It won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish like a person who builds his house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Build your marriage on a firm foundation. Build it on bedrock. 
on the rock because I can tell you after nearly 24 years and some days I feel like we're just getting started. I can tell you after nearly 24 years that has been the most important connection building our marriage on Jesus and his word. And yes, we need to do all the things we've talked about today and in this series, but it has been Jesus and his truth that has connected us in a deeper way, that sustained us, that has grounded and guided us. Without it, I don't know where we'd be. It's helped us keep our commitment, our covenant, our agreement. It's what we always come back to. As I was studying Matthew 7, it it led me to Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 16 to 17. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. I will test you with the measuring line of justice and the plumb line of righteousness. Since your refuge is made of lies, a hailstorm will knock it down. Since it is made of deception, a flood will sweep it away. The foundation stone that Isaiah was predicting, prophesying, was Jesus. Jesus, the foundation stone. Unless we build our marriages on the foundation stone when the storms come and they will come the elements are likely to wash you away you need it to endure so what's an example of an enduring relationship well that brings us to part two of our talk today and back to our original text and this time I'm going to add verse 31 to 32 As Paul says, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one marriage. This is a great mystery, Paul says, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one and that is a relationship that has endured. Part two, Christ and the church. And it will blow your mind when you think how the church has endured since the church of Christ was born in the book of Acts in the New Testament until today. It has endured, connected people, changed lives, saved lives, dispensed grace, brought relief to our world. Even now in war-torn areas and famine-stricken regions, you will find evidence of Christ and his church, the church moving God's mission in the world forward. For the church that evermore, lifting holy hands above, offering up on every shore her pure sacrifice of love. Now let's just admit it. The church is messy. Why? Because of us. Because we're all involved, right? But she is beautiful. So beautiful that Christ gave up his life for her, his bride, the body of Christ, for us. And he calls us to be committed to the church just like we are to a marriage to connect into community in the context of the local church to not quit when it's messy to deal with our own stuff as far as it depends on us to keep it real and to build on a firm foundation and oh remember this Christ says in the Bible that he's coming back to redeem his bride and he instructs us to stay committed later in Matthew chapter 25 as Jesus teaches in metaphors he's referencing the church being ready for the bridegroom and concludes by saying in verse 10 of Matthew 25 the bridegroom came then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was locked I know what side of the door I want to be on and then the writer of Hebrews gets direct about our commitment to the bride to the church with these words in chapter 10 verse 23 let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do but encourage one another especially now that the day of his return is drawing near the bridegroom returning for his bride and then remember Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 now I know in part We don't truly understand. We only know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So get this. Our text today says that marriage is, while being a great mystery, an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. This is also mind-blowing when you think about it. Because no marriage is perfect. 
No church is perfect, yet Christ is perfect, and one day he's coming back to redeem it all, us all. And we will overcome, it says in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 11. We'll overcome by the blood of the Lamb, what Jesus did for us on the cross, and the word of our testimony, our faith, and our commitment. Then it'll all make sense then we will know and be known fully. So until then, what do we do? We commit, we trust, and we don't quit. There's going to be plenty of reasons to quit the church, trust me. Just like a marriage. In a marriage, there's two main reasons to quit, right? Because there's two of us. In the church, there's a whole bunch of reasons because there's a lot of people. I've been around the church a while, and people will say things you don't like, Play things you don't like, do things you don't like, sing things you don't like, wear things you don't like, have opinions you don't like, vote for people you don't like. Shall I keep going? The list is long. But just like a marriage, barring abusive and toxic situations, just like a marriage or a family, when it gets messy, we don't quit our family, right? Or maybe you do, but should you? Author David Timms grapples with this in a recent blog when he writes, the fastest rising religious category in the United States is the nuns. Now over 30% of US adults, people who claim no particular religious affiliation, none, the nuns. I imagine that the rise of the nuns is in part accelerated by the duns, people who are done with the church done for all the reasons I listed and a whole bunch more. Tim's goes on to write, if you are done, I'm not surprised. And I have no criticism of you, nor judgment of you. Indeed, I might say God understands, because if I can understand, then surely he does too. But somewhere deep within my soul, I believe that our best shot at a thriving life is not discovered in isolation or independence, but in community within the body of Christ, the church. Yes, it can be the source of our deepest hurts. I can't deny it. But I also know that, it's, that in its healthiest versions, the church can nurture our greatest growth and most flourishing lives. It's where I see the hand of God at work in the wounded, the grieving, the weak, and the sick. It's where on its best days I see faith hope and love in their purest human forms. It's where I see past my own tunnel vision and am consistently reminded of God's transforming grace. Where do we find such churches? They seem few and far between. But I wonder if some of us might find that such a church is within us. And when enough of us, each of us, show up with authenticity, integrity, humility, love, and faith, a community takes shape before our very eyes and it can be beautiful and life-giving. Authenticity, integrity, humility, faith, love. Sounds like a healthy marriage. A healthy marriage built on a firm foundation, built on bedrock, because the rains will come and the floodwaters will rise and the wind will beat against that house, against your marriage, against the church. But if we're built on that firm foundation, on that bedrock, at the end of it all, we will stand. So what storm do you find yourself in the middle of right now? Or maybe it's a recent storm, or maybe even not so recent of a storm, but you are still feeling the effects of that. And the odds are that there are many in this room and watching online where their marriages haven't survived that storm. The stats are staggering. But I'm here to tell you today there's grace to cover it, and there's a firm foundation to rebuild upon. But if you're in the middle of the fight right now, keep fighting. 
Maybe you're wondering if you can keep standing. Well, just get on your knees and fight and fight on that firm foundation and don't fight alone. Reach out to us. This is a family that you belong to. We will come alongside you and help you to keep going and keep fighting. Or maybe for you, you're just about done with faith in God. You're just about done with the church because of some really tough stuff that has been a part of your story that you attribute to the church or what you, you might call organized religion. You know what? God can handle your disappointment. God can handle your doubts, your anger, even your blame. But even though deep down, you know, you know Jesus isn't to blame. He warned us that was, this was going to be rough. When he said, in this world, you will have what? Trouble. But then he said, take heart, I have overcome the world, which is eternal perspective for any storm or struggle. But if that's you today and you're, you feel like you're done with faith, done with the church, maybe you've got drug along today because it's Thanksgiving weekend, maybe you're, you're watching online. If you're willing to have one more conversation, we'd find it a privilege to have that conversation with you about your disappointment processing that maybe it's a first conversation maybe it's just naming this there'll be a number on the screen that you can text later and we will follow up come find us in the lobby we're happy to have that conversation with you because the church is not perfect but she is beautiful and I'm so grateful for all the years that I have grown and learnt and been supported and been challenged and been loved in the context of community in the local church because she is the hope of the world. She is and will truly be one day God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So what am I grateful for this Thanksgiving? I'm grateful for the bride, the church. I'm grateful for my bride, Mandy, for our family, for our community, for this community and the freedom to worship together. But most of all, I'm thankful for Jesus and what he did so that one day all will be made new. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ not counting people's sins against them, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God sent his son so that we could build on a firm foundation, stand on a firm foundation so that we would always have a reason to be grateful and to know that he won't fail us. He won't. Because he's already saved us. How? By giving up his life. His body broken on a cross. For us. For the bride. For the body. For each of us. His blood shed to pay our sin debt and restore a covenant and agreement with God that we couldn't keep. The old hymn says it so beautifully. For thyself, for Jesus, best gift divine. To our race so freely given. For that great, great love of thine. Peace on earth and joy in heaven. Peace on earth. Peace on earth, no matter how severe the storm, no matter how dark the day, no matter how deep the valley. Peace in knowing the end of the story, that Jesus wins. And when we choose to follow him, we win too. And that's always a reason to be grateful. Let's pray together. God, we breathe in your goodness today.
but you love us so much, God, that you sent your son to restore relationship, to restore a covenant and an agreement and relationship with you that we broke. You love us so much that you allowed your son to give up his life in our place so that we could always be in relationship with you. We could always have a firm foundation to stand on, to build on, to live on, no matter what. And so as we come to a time in our worship today when we remember what you did to a time of communion, Lord, we do so with grateful hearts, with prayers and songs of grateful praise. In your name. Amen. So we're going to move to a time of communion and remember what Christ did for us. Reach for those cups that you got from the baskets at the back, the bread representing his broken body, the juice, his shed blood. Maybe you prepared something ahead of time online. If you're not ready to take communion this morning, just take this time to reflect and then we'll continue to worship.